Hi, I'm Jack Oman from the Sacramento Bee. Over the past few months, I've done a series of cartoons about my dad in long-term care. In conjunction with the Bee and the PBS NewsHour, this series has examined some of the issues involved, including hospitalization, living in a retirement center, and also rehabilitation facilities, along with some of the vagaries of getting old, as well as adult children taking care of their elderly parents. The Bee and I decided to turn this into a video, and we hope it provides some insight into the challenges involved. We hope you enjoy the care package. My father was fairly active until he was 72. That's when he broke his back and didn't know it. He was at my stepsister's wedding. He tripped. I missed catching him by a millisecond. For some reason, the C6 fracture didn't show up on the initial x-ray. He just complained about it for several years and used a cane. He constantly said that getting old ain't for sissies. Dad was married to Peg Bracken, the noted cookbook author and humorist. She died in 2007 and 89. They had decided to move into an assisted living apartment complex called Terwilliger Plaza in Portland, Oregon. They had lived in a 3,000 square foot house full of 89 years of knickknacks and power tool collecting. It took months to sort it all out. She had thousands of books, hundreds of cat figurines, and dozens of platters. My dad was a highly competent PhD research scientist. He also won the Bronze Star in Korea as a radio operator. He once said, they gave out lots of Bronze Stars in Korea. Dad discovered many new forms of fungi in the northern hardwood states. So when small technical things began to flummox him, I began to get more concerned. He and Peg were always talking about the Hemlock Society, the pro-suicide group, and the hid pills. The thing that concerned me most was the 38 Special I found hidden in his nightstand. Terwilliger Plaza did not allow any guns on the premises. Oddly, I had thought he'd kept it for burglars. For some elderly people, the end of life comes rather quickly. For my father, it was a series of unpleasant and annoying events that punctuated the end. This went on for four years. The hardest ailment to watch was his edema-filled foot. He had to wear his shoes without the laces tied. Oddly, he was cheerful and optimistic most of the time. He even gave me a pep talk after the 2008 stock market crash. Once I get this foot problem solved, it'll be good as new. Now let me tell you why the U.S. economy is the strongest in the world. He had acquired the sad tools required for old age, a red walker. He regularly called it a real Cadillac, a grabber, very expensive hearing aids, and a green enamel cane. I'm saving it for later if I need it. His conversation alternated between philosophical observations and nostalgic reminiscences. Once in the hospital, he said, I'm a scientist, I know what's happening. Another time he said, I just got Herb Alpert in the Tijuana Brass. When he was coming out of surgery, he said, I used to line up my toy soldiers, then I'd pick them off with my BB gun. It was a lot of fun. And then he immediately went back to sleep in 1938. One day he said, I want to go fishing. He could barely walk. So I decided to take him on a float trip down the Willamette River with a guide named Ethan. Ethan and I lifted him in and out of the drift boat. He didn't weigh that much. He was down 70 pounds. You're going to catch some nice cutthroats today, John, Ethan said. And so he did. In fact, it was the biggest trout we caught. For six hours, he was back to being my dad again. Read him and weep, boys, he said. Full of army poker banter, the sign he was in a good mood. The fishing trip ended well, except for the truck I backed into at the boat ramp. But it made me profoundly sad. I knew this was the last trip. It conjured this image of my dad in the stern of his boat, running the outboard motor and smoking. The air smelled of coffee, exhaust, and palm malls. There comes a moment in taking care of a parent when you know there's no turnaround. There's no getting well soon, or he'll bite back like he always does. 
There's a grim existential acceptance by both parent and child. There is no exit. I kept trying to have what I had hoped would be meaningful conversations. Dad pretty much refused to have them. This one really stuck with me. When he was in the cardiac care unit the night before his surgery, I asked him, so dad, is there anything you want to say to me now? And he knew damned well what I meant. He replied, nope. He did recover from that one, but the back surgery was extremely challenging. The only time I ever lost my temper with him was when I talked to him about his drinking immediately before the dangerous spinal fusion operation. He called it a Hail Mary. I told him I had one drink a day. Damn it, you can't lie to them about that. You could die. If you're not going to work with me, why should I work with you? And I left. For those of you unfamiliar with them, rehab centers are for people well enough to be discharged from a hospital but still need skilled care. My dad was in and out of them for months. Okay, John, we're going to walk you down the hall and back. These workers were always unfailingly cheerful. Drinking and his relationship with it, shall we say, was a constant concern. Look, I get that he was in the Mad Men generation. In many ways, it badly affected my life. One time he said, why don't you drink? You're missing out on the good things in life. I also know it contributed heavily to his health problems and prevented him from getting into some rehab facilities. I would visit Dad each day, sometimes twice. You could tell how good the facility was by the quality of the television sets. This dump doesn't even have flat screens. I was so exhausted by the crosstown commute to the rehab, and I usually couldn't get to my own teenage kids until 8 or later each night. One night, my son asked me how Grandpa was, and I said, don't let me get like that. All he wanted to do was go home, me too. But the last year was an endless cycle of emergency room runs. I would race to wherever the ambulance took him and was grateful it was usually the one by my house about a mile away. All three of my kids were born at the same hospital, circle of life. But I never knew if it was the last visit. About 20 years ago, my father and my friends thought I had died on an Idaho fishing trip. Actually, I hadn't died, I was missing. Dad was in and out of hospitals for surgeries, outpatient visits, checkups, prescriptions, emergency room runs, and falls. I knew in my heart that this was his last fall. Dad was tired, he missed Peg, and he was beaten down by the needles, the pain, and the fear. To me, everything seemed poignant, minimalist, even childlike. I'm weak as a kitten. I'm always so cold. Give me ice. Sometimes I had to do very unpleasant tasks that would make me ill. I wasn't trained as a nurse and had no stomach for it. Mostly Dad had people come in for this stuff, but I did my share. I had put in a catheter. I'd helped him get out of showers. And I never threw up, but I retched a lot. The moment you realize your dad is dying, really dying, is mind-bending. My mom died 23 years earlier at age 56, and that was horrific, and I tried to deny it. He was two weeks away from death when he said, I think I'm dying. And I said, you're not dying, your sister was way worse off than you are, and she lived to be 83. When your parent is always in the hospital, you're always in the hospital too, without the service. I had my favorite waiting rooms, knew where all the good vending machines were, and always had my iPhone and laptop with me. I always stayed in a corner that was always deserted. I also spent a lot of time hanging around Dad's apartment while he slept, which was most of the time. Sometimes I spent the night. One evening, he sent me down to the car. I had to open the trunk. I found the 38 pistol. He had moved it again. Now I realized why he kept it. I left it there. He was too weak to get it. When they found me in Idaho on that fishing trip, my father had tears in his eyes. What's wrong? He said, I'm just glad to see you, son. He had never, ever called me son before. This memory always kept me going. Dad's last illness was colon failure caused by a bacteria called C. difficile, or C. diff. This required colon removal. A very upbeat surgeon who went to the University of Minnesota, his alma mater, told him, We'll get you fixed right back up, John. 
And I said, she went to Minnesota, Dad, they know the deal. I maintained my chipper denial attitude for him. He went into surgery. They removed his colon and that was the ball game. He barely regained consciousness except to say no and this. A nurse asked him, do you know who that is, John? And he sat up and he said, hiya, Jack. Those were the last words he said to me. One of dad's main problems after the colon surgery was kidney failure and they weren't firing at all. Now I had to wear a mask and gown in the ICU. Finally, the doctors told me that we had to make a decision. I knew what they were getting at, and we set up a meeting. Jack, he can't survive on his own. It's been five days. A nurse said he'd be on dialysis, and that would give him a few months, more or less. Another doctor said, I went through this with my own parents. It's very hard. I'm very sorry. My brother was on the conference call. It was over. In a universe of poignant, terrible moments, one I remember so vividly was when an ICU nurse jabbed him with a needle and he cried out, no, in a loud voice. And I said to the nurse, if he's going to die, why are you giving him a diabetes shot? Dad was moved to a room where patients go to die. No equipment, no sound. My sons and I and a close friend were there. It was overcast and very cool for June 24th. We waited and waited. Oddly, his face was very relaxed. He looked like he was 23 again. I brought photos of his mother and father, a photo of his favorite spot as a child, a bayou in Marquette, Michigan, and his compass. I put the compass in his hand. A minister came in and read from our family Bible. I spoke to him in tears for hours. Remember when I knocked the hook out of that musky mouth at Lake Winnie? Around 7.30 p.m., I left Dad's side for a moment. My youngest son was in the room with him. There was a beautiful sunset in Portland. I took a few photos with my phone. Then my son came out to say, you need to come in here. Dad was gone.